So this is, uh, oh, if you want to be on a competition team, you got to move fast. I think the CPTC team is already pretty much full. Someone said they might need one more um, alternate. So you could do that. That's the more difficult one. But National Cyber League can take any number of students. And it's at a lower level. It's at the Security Plus level. So if you want to participate in either of those, send an email or fill out this form. And uh, we'll help you get involved soon. All right. So we're here at 152. And today it is forensic duplication. So I got that here. Uh, this is the classic forensics information that you'll that has been around forever, in the forensics class and also in the incident response class. So if you, um, you can, of course, just copy data. The way you would copy data to make a backup or anything else, that's one way to do it. Just copy a bunch of files. And of course, that counts. That's evidence. The only problem is you're not able to recover deleted files. Forensic duplication usually refers to where you copy every bit on the source device including the bits are, that are not currently in use, so they're not currently connected to a file name and a creation date and so on. Uh, either of these, though, the goal is to create admissible evidence in court proceedings, and either one of these is fine in court as long as you can explain what you did and defend it. Um, so you have to, the, to a for proper forensic image that gives, lets you re recover deleted files, you have to get every bit of accessible data on the storage medium a complete duplicate of it, and you must be able to handle read errors in some manner. You may have read errors on a hard drive, and you should not just stop at the first read error. So you, you have to have a write blocker, so you make no changes to the original medium. That's very important. And you have to, therefore, have repeatable results, if possible. And uh, you should have logs recording what you did. So you want to get every bit. Now, by the way, you don't really get every bit. That's kind of a misnomer. There are parts of the hard drive and SSD that are not available for the user to store files on at all because they contain the firmware, the hardware and software used by the, uh, the disk drive to run itself, the host protected area. Now, you can, in principle, if you try hard enough, write things in the host protected area, and I used to do it in the 70s and the 80s with floppy drives back then, but um, there have been a few forensic tools that actually recover the host protected area, and in practice, it's so rare that you find anything valuable there that nobody much cares. <coughs> but in print, so no, normally, what you call a complete forensic image does not include the host protected area, and nobody really cares. So there's different kinds of images. Complete disk is the main one you want, or every bit on a disk. Then you can have a partition. If your disk is partitioned into drives like C, D, and E, you'd get one of those, or a logical acquisition, which would be the contents of one folder or certain files. So a complete disk, your disk looks like this. You have a boot sector used to boot from the disk. Then you have the OEM partition, which records um, where partitions are available. Then you might have partitions here. And that's so you do the whole complete disk image. You just get every bit of this, every part of it, including all these control areas. If you do a partition, you just get this part of it. This might be C, and that might be D. And if you do a logical image, you just get some of the files on a partition the ones in one folder, the ones owned by a particular user, or something like that. And then, of course, you're only getting active data. You're not getting any deleted data in that case. You can view them in HXD. HXD, you can view raw disks directly. It's a great disk editor. You can view a raw disk, or you can view just a partition. You can choose either one. And so if you look at the raw disk, you'll see uh, the NTFS mark down here and uh, down here, this one will start at the NTFS mark because this partition is formatted NTFS. All right. You can use FTK Imager or any other a variety of software to get it, but FTK Imager is the most common. <coughs> so you choose what you want to get. The, um, the physical drive will be the whole drive, logical drive, or you can read from a file contents of a folder or so on. Physical drive is what you usually do to get the whole disk. I see some comments here talking about Ukrainians. Yeah, trying to raise money to buy their sleeping bags and such. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Anyway, um, so you can choose how you want to save it. When you get the data, you can put it in a variety of formats. All these are the same. They all contain exactly the same bits from the hard drive. It just depends how you store them. The DD image is just a one-for-one -one map. So if you have a 500 gig drive, you will get a file 500 gigs long. The others are just compressed in various ways. That's really the only difference. Um, they also have some metadata. So if the user, try, the suspect, tries to delete data, <coughs> if they really use a forensic tool like eraser or steganography, then that data is really gone. Then they clear the clusters and they overwrite them. But most 
perps don't know that. They do foolish things like just delete the file and empty the recycle bin or reformat or reinstall the OS. And none of those actually clean off all the clusters. They leave a lot of data behind. So then if you get a whole drive image, you can recover a lot of the deleted files. Um, now, mentioned the, the host protected area and device configuration overlay. These are the parts used by the disks firmware and software itself, and so you could hide stuff there, but nobody bothers to collect it with any of the main forensic tools. Um, so active data is the kind of data you normally use, data that's in use, it has a file name, it has an owner, and it's, it's in the directory. This is the only data that normal people care about, the only data that normal backup systems make. Um, the unallocated space is the part of the disk that is not currently attached in the directory to any file, and therefore, it can, have, it can be empty or it can contain fragments of deleted files. Um, it might contain complete deleted files. In fact, it often does because a saved file might only be you know, 10 or 20 clusters and you might not have overwritten any of those 20 clusters so the entire file is still sitting there. The only thing you've lost is the metadata. You no longer know the file name or the owner or the creation date but the entire file is very often still just sitting there um, in an allocated space. Now Slack is just fragments. Since the hard drive writes a sector at a time, it must write 512 bytes all the time. So if you have a file that's less shorter than 512 bytes or ends on non-even multiple of 512 bytes, then there's some extra bytes left, perhaps up to 500 or 511 in principle, bytes of data left over at the end of a file that is actually from the previous file. So you might have a small amount of data there. You'll never find a complete file or a file header but you might find some readable text or something. The file slack is like the host protected area, an area where you almost never find anything useful. But the unallocated space often contains complete images, complete Word documents, and useful things like that. So you can do a partition image, um, but this is not common. It, the only reason you'd do this would be if you are somehow only have authority to capture one partition, which is kind of weird, um, or a very large disk or something, you could do it, and then you would be able to recover the deleted files on that partition. But normally, uh, this is not a common situation. You either have access to the whole, you have authority to take the whole disk, or only to take the files owned by a certain user, and then you're only allowed to take the active files. It would, it's not very common that you have authority to get one partition only. The logical image is just a simple copy of files or folders, the active data. The file recovery software, yes, the file recovery software automatically recovers from unallocated space, and autopsy and FTK and NK should do that automatically. So um, you'll see it, in fact, in the, uh, yeah, all the forensic software now does that automatically because that's extremely useful because it's very common that the um, perpetrator is trying to hide their evidence by deleting files. So the deleted files are often very important. Yeah? Well, this is a good question. Saying people might hide, people supposedly hide their child porn somewhere special. Um, they often, sometimes hide it with steganography, I know, where they hide it inside of their images. And in principle, people have worried that they might put it in the host protected area. That's why people thought collecting the host protected area might be valuable. But if you do that, there's only a very small amount of space available. So in practice, what people have told me is, at first they said, oh, we'll, uh, the product, we'll buy the special product to get the host protected area because they might have the porn there. But in fact, uh, people that view child porn are compulsive. They want lots and lots and lots of it. So you don't have to find it all. There are going to be thousands of images. You, all you need to do is find some of them. That's why in practice, people decided it wasn't worth the bother in general. But that's what you could put it there. Yeah. Uh, there's also I've, a tool... Uh, one of the encryption tools had the ability to encrypt your hard drive and then encrypt it again and make it look like you could decrypt it and it would show you almost nothing on there, but there was another layer of encryption hidden under it. That's another tool, That's another way to hide data on a disk. And encryption is a real problem. This host protected area turns out to not be important, but encryption is a real problem. Things like uh, BitLocker. If they encrypt it with BitLocker and you don't have the password, you're hosed. You can't get any of the data. The only thing you can do is, is get it while it's still logged in and turned on. It's a very good question. Let's see, I just had an accident where I needed to use FTK Imager to recover data. Yeah, yeah, FTK Imager is fine. Yeah, recovering deleted files is good. Yep, this is why um, 
you know, for as four related activities, there's recovering deleted files that's lost, data recovery, that's mainly what Drive Savers does. There's e-discovery, which is collecting data for a lawsuit. There's computer forensics, which is collecting data as evidence of a crime. And then there's an incident response, which is collecting evidence to find out what attackers are doing on your network. And they all use very similar tools and similar techniques. They're all closely related jobs. So a logical image is fairly common. For example, if you have a share, a file share, shared by many people, and you're only authorized to investigate one person, then you can't take all the data off the file server. You can only take the data owned by that one user. So that's what you just make a live collection of that data. You would not get any deleted files because you can't say who owns the deleted files. All right, and another common issue is that you uh, cannot take it offline or duplicate the whole drive. Um, so you just do an image. All right, uh, do a logical image. So uh, you save the file metadata, creation times and permissions, and you save it in some, uh, like a zip file and make a hash, so it's easy to make a duplicate and verify that the duplicate is accurate. And the imagers, any of the forensic collectors can do this. Now, you, there's all kinds of non-standard data that is evidence. Somebody might give you a USB stick full of evidence. Uh, you might just take a photograph of something you see. I mean, there's a lot of data that is not really of this format. So it's not like there's anything wrong with that. It's evidence. I mentioned before, there have been cases where police, uh, police just found a cell phone at a screen and they didn't have any forensic software, so they just paged through the messages and took photographs. And that's evidence. It counts. It is information you found. It's not perfect. You haven't made a perfect copy of all the data on the device or anything, but you have found something. Remember, the real evidence is the human testifying in court, saying, I saw this. That's the real evidence. The digital stuff is just backup for that. So anyway, um, you might any of these things, you might get these things, and if you get evidence in a non-standard way, you just document where you got it and include it in your evidence. And then there may be arguments later of whether that was a reliable source and whether it had been modified and stuff, but you know, uh, the forensic examiner just has to document truthfully where all the evidence came from, and then decisions will be made later about which evidence matters and how reliable it all is. So you try to make hashes of whatever you got so you can verify that when you make a copy of it, the copy is accurate. And for this, MD5s are fine because they can't really be forged in that case. But anyway, people use SHA-1 and SHA-2, and that's fine. Any kind of MD5 or stronger hash is fine. Just make sure that copies are accurate. If you have a drive with bad sectors, then they give unpredictable random data every time you read it, and then the MD5 will be different every time you engine the drive. So you just record that that's the problem with this drive and we cannot rely on the MD5. That's, it doesn't mean that data is useless, but it does mean that you can't do a second acquisition from the same drive and get the same MD5. So uh, here's some of those image formats you saw before. Access this, the native uh, format for FTK is the Advanced Forensic Framework I've never seen anybody use it. This is the one everybody uses, which in case inherited from a previous product called Expert Witness, this is the .e01, .e02. This is by far the most common format. Uh, both of these store your um, image and they store some metadata like the hashes. Um, and they're both compressed and they split it into several files. This is important because most Windows formats won't let you store a file bigger than two gigabytes and USB sticks often won't. So if you have 100 gigabytes, you break it up into a lot of little two gigabyte files is uh, what all these things will do by default to make it easy for you to copy them onto various volumes. DD files are what the Linux DD tool makes. That's just a direct copy of the drive. So a 500 gig drive results in a single 500 gig file. And no compression, no extra hash, no extra data like hashes, nothing. Now, the some uh, American forensic labs have written some modified versions of DZ, like DCF LDD from the Digital Computer Forensics Lab, which does a DD, and then it makes a separate text file, which has uh, the hashes and a log of the time it was collected and things like that, which is nice. So your documentation have to include your hashes, a chain of custody, and you'll have reports and other documents as your investigation proceeds. So you can choose any of those disk formats. They're all identical. You can just convert one to the other. You convert DD to E01 or AFF. They all contain exactly the same bits, the same way that a zip file contains exactly the same data as an unzip file. That's all. But um, most commercial tools expect expert witness files. Open source tools typically require DD files. And if you're going to actually image some multi-disk array, then you've got a real chore of finding the stripes across all those disks and reassembling the files. So you probably want DD files for that. And you'll have to do a whole 
processing on them. And this is the kind of thing that um, drive shaver does all the time. You can go in there and say my whole raid crashed and they will image all the drives and re put it back together. And they do a similar job called chip off forensics on SSDs. They can disassemble the SSD, remove the chips, and take the data off each chip separately, and then reconstruct it to make sure they really get all the data. And so, but that's a pretty advanced, complicated job, and almost nobody bothers with that. A normal forensic examiner wouldn't do that at all. If you need that done, you just go to an expert, outsource it to an expert in that, like drive savers, because that's ridiculously complicated work, and you don't normally need that. Let's take a look at a Kahoot, which is 8A. There's different music, it's pretty silly sounding stuff there. <laughs> I could pre program a different music for each one of these, but the options aren't too impressive, so anyway. I had to pay these guys some money now, they finally busted me for having more than 10 students. So now I should complain and demand better music. Where's the hidden part of the hard disk? Yeah, that's the host protected area. Contains software used to run the disk and not any user files. All right, which one will allow you to recover deleted files? Forensic image of a hard drive. All right. All right. What type of acquisition will recover deleted files? whole disk to get all the deleted files. A partition will get you some of them. These won't get you any deleted files. All right. All right. What type of acquisition will make sure that you only get files owned by the suspect? logical acquisition. And you're only getting active data, of course, because anything that's not in the directory, you don't know who owns it. All right, what kind of image is most likely to be accepted in court? Are 
all the same. They're all mathematically identical. NCASE has spent a lot of time trying to convince people that you must use NCASE. It's the only thing that will be accepted in court. And that might be true if you're a clumsy, incompetent examiner, but a competent examiner can explain this clearly, that they're all the same and it's fine. And there are forensic examiners that use homemade tools and Linux tools and just DD images, and they can win in court. It just is up to the examiner to be convincing and have credentials and convince them that you know what you're doing. If you're clumsy and all you've done is take like a 10-hour vendor course on how to use a tool, then you're totally dependent on your tool and you can't explain why it should be trusted. You just say, well, it's a well-known tool and that's a different kind of argument to make. All right, what kind of image is easiest for open source to use? DD is the natural one for open source tools like Linux based ones. Well, they'll have to tell me who they are if they want their points. And I'm on who that is. And Bro, I think I know who that is too. Alright, good. Alright, let's go back to here. And. All right, so uh, what's a good tool for double encryption? Well, the only tool that ever offered that was uh, something crypt for Windows. It was the standard for Windows and they TrueCrypt. TrueCrypt had that ability. That would be the thing to get. It's technically been abandoned, but I think you can still use it. Um, anyway. Uh, that's what I was describing before. Uh, I think TrueCrypt had a mode where you could encrypt your hard drive twice so you could, if you were arrested and they demanded a password, you could give them one password and it would decrypt to one thing, but there was more secret hidden data that you'd only see if you put in a second password. And they were hoping to fool police and forensic examiners with that. I don't know how well it works, but I heard people talk about it. So it's, it's a classic static image. Um, it, this is a traditional forensics we've been doing for decades where you turn off the computer and you just image the hard drive with a write blocker and you get an exact duplicate of it. You can also boot from a forensic live DVD, which is what students do in classes, but the pros don't do it that way because it's too likely to fail. You just use a real hardware write blocker. That's the professional way to do it. And that's what you have. You buy one of these things, they cost hundreds of bucks. And this thing simulates the drive. So your computer believes it's seeing a hard drive and it blocks all the right signals but lets you read the drive without changing anything. And that's just much more reliable to protect the evidence than some kind of software that might fail. Um, you need this, and here's some of the brand names to blow and Wybatech. Uh, you need this because modern operating systems write to every drive. As soon as they connect, they start writing things on it, like the recycle bin and the log and timestamps. They they don't they start writing as soon as they connect to a drive. So you have to have soft uh, this hardware that will accept those commands and tell the operating system that it wrote without really writing. All right. So that's uh, there are forensic live DVDs that do this. Sarugi is one I use that's good. There's a bunch of them. They block writing with software, so you can use them to do an image of a drive without modifying it, but, you know, it's, uh, it's more reliant on the examiner not making a mistake, which is, you know, having a piece of hardware is much more likely to be reliable. So you make your image with FTK Imager or a, any of these DD tools, or there's an end case gives you an imager. You can also get a hardware disk duplicator, which is even handier. You just plug in a drive, plug in another drive, hit the button, and off it goes. Um, I see a private message. This may be someone identifying who they are. Um, oh, good. Okay. Good. All right. Let me make a note. I've got a first name of this person anyway. That may be enough. All right. So those are expensive, but of course convenient. And so here's your considerations. Are you write protecting the thing you're imaging? Um, Make sure that if you can't use hardware write protection, which might be because you have some strange device where you don't have the right cables or something, then um, consider whether your examination environment is going to try to change it. Make sure you have enough space somewhere to store the data um, and you understand how to execute command line commands if you have to use them. This is why most people prefer 
hardware write blockers and Windows graphical tools. Most people can use them more effectively than Linux tools like DD, where all you have to do is make a mistake typing in the commands and you wipe out the evidence. Um, all right, so DD is available, and these other versions of DD store the missing uh, hash value and logs, so they're nice. Um, and so this is the problem. Like I said, every modern OS automatically mounts a disk and does a bunch of writing on the disk as soon as it touches it. So you have to not let that happen. Forensic live DVDs block that, but the problem is you have to connect another drive to take the evidence, and you have to execute commands to let you write to that drive and then copy from this drive, and it's possible to do it backwards and destroy the evidence. That's why having a hardware write blocker is more likely to work because you know which drive you connected it to and you can't make an easy mistake uh, and write to it. NCASE has a lot of tools. NCASE Forensic will let you do it right from Windows. They have some command line utilities and they give you a Linux-based boot disk from NCASE you can use to acquire data like Sarugi if you want to. And many, you know, most people that buy these things are Windows shops, they're like the Windows software, and they like to use all the uh, commercial products that come with their suite. And of course, it's much more pleasant to use. Then there's live acquisition, which is mainly what you do in instant response, but it's another option for any uh, kind of investigation. Um, this is where you have a computer that's running and you take an image of the hard drive while it's running. Now this is technically a smear. This means that the data on the drive is changing while you're collecting it. So some of the data is from an earlier time than a later time. So it's not even a fixed time slice, really. So that's why it's considered kind of imperfect and unprofessional. But it might be fine. It is data that came off that drive. It'll tell you something. Like they say, any imperfect collection procedure is OK as long as you document what you did. You know, you often have to make compromises, you sign, you make mistakes. So whatever you do, just write down what you really did and then tell the truth in court. And the worst that will happen is they'll be mad at you for doing the wrong thing. But um, trying to lie is the only thing that will really get you in big trouble. So if you do live imaging, there's, of course, no write blocker. The machine is running. You're changing the system. You're running software on a running system. So you're changing the RAM and possibly the hard drive, too. Um, you might destroy evidence or burden the system. So the best thing is not to install anything, but run some kind of uh, imager like FTK Imager Lite that runs off a network share or USB drive. Um, and of course, here's one of the many problems. Apple hardware, like an Apple um, uh, MacBook Air, everything is built in. It's hard to take it apart. Um, it has strange connectors. One thing you can do in Apple devices, you can reboot them into target disk mode where it acts like a portable hard drive and you can connect with a Firewire or Thunderbolt and access it like a like remote drive. That's one good way to image it. Um, and there is one Linux distribution from Italy that will actually let you, um, I used to use it in my class, DEFT. The DEFT forensic image system from Italy will actually um, image MacBook Airs by just booting from it. So that's pretty good. And you can buy a write protector, but you know, uh, Apple makes everything difficult. They got special components, special screws. They're hard to take apart. Um, if you have these big things, multi, multiple drive arrays, then these are really complicated. And normally, that's crazy. Normally, you don't want to try to image the whole thing because it's way too much data. Um, normally, um, you can do it, but typically, you just do a live image because it's and it's hard to justify the heroic amount of work it would take to gather all that data and then reassemble it. That is what Drive Shavers does, but they don't do it for forensic examination. They do it to recover the data. For example, uh, they told us the entire movie Toy Story was lost. They spent like millions of dollars and months of work and put it on an array and the raid failed. And they took it to Drive Shavers and they recovered it off the, by, through this process, imaging every drive, rebuilding every bit. I'm sure they paid a lot of money for that. It can be done, but normally an investigation does not justify that kind of expense, only something really valuable that's been lost. A live image, not a logical copy. Oh, they're essentially the same thing, yeah. A, a logical copy can be done with a hard drive that is not running, a running system. You can take the hard drive off and then copy only some of the data. Um, but uh, typically, you do a logical image with a live acquisition. This is what you see most often in forensics. In, in, excuse me, instant response, which we're talking about. You do, uh, this is what our main tool we're going to use, VelociRaptor, does. It runs software on the machine and harvests just certain data. You don't even try to get the whole drive or the deleted files. You just try to get certain targeted data. 
And by the way, this is what the NSA has been doing, right? The NSA has been hoovering up all the data on the internet, and then they say we get it all, and then we only look at the part we're authorized to look at. We only look at the foreign data. So you could do something like that. That's, uh, that's another thing to do. You can get it all, and then you only take the part you're allowed to have and use that in court. Anyway, a lot of things are virtualized. Servers are almost all virtualized. A lot of people are using virtual machines on their clients, too. So if that happens, it's extremely easy. You don't need a write blocker or anything because a virtual machine is just a bunch of files. This is a virtual Kali machine. These VMDK files are the hard drive. And here's the virtual memory. That's the RAM. And then there's some configuration files. If you just copy all the um, files in this folder, that is the whole thing. That is the image of the machine. So you don't need any forensic software or anything for virtual machines. It's very nice. No write blocker, no nothing. They're just sitting there. Um, you can just turn off the virtual machine or suspend it. And when you suspend it, it will freeze everything, including the memory. And you've got files right there you can just copy, which is very handy. All right. So let's take a look at another Kahoot. I don't know if I can find another music that's good here. Outer space. It does sound kind of spooky, doesn't it? Sounds more like the Halloween music. Anyway. Somebody's idea of outer space. This is the kind of stuff where you can tell people to have money. Like Microsoft paid artists tons of money to make those beautiful backgrounds in Windows Vista. And Apple spent tons of money perfecting their boot up sound, the boom. They paid artists to work hard on those things. All right, let's give it a shot. All right, so software included in every Linux distribution. All right, now that's DD. Well, I guess teachers will have to pay something, and I, I don't know if they're going to make new music, but anyway. I've been using this thing for years. I wonder if they're finally going to get around to charging for it. <laughs> All right. Free Windows software. FTK Energy, the main one I use, although uh, I saw an article that said it actually uses more system resources and is sloppier than other ones, but it has been the standard for many years. All right, which system allows you to collect a complete disk image by just copying a few files? Virtual machines. The hard drive and memory and everything is really just a few files. Very handy. All right, which one is particularly useful for Macs? Disk mode on a Mac. Good. All right. 
So AA, that might be real initials. I really might be able to figure it out. That might be a real name. Well, I think it might be an alias or something. And the manual theories have one. But they're not going to get their function unless they come and do their own. Hey, okay, good. AA has told me who he is. Good. Alright. Stop this. Stop this recording.